So, um, hello, I am Amber Brown, um, commonly known as Hawkow on the internet. Um, here is my Twitter and my website. So I have quality Twitter posts. Those of you that follow me know that I'm lying. Um, so I live in uh, Perth, Western Australia. Um, if you're wondering where that is in the world, it's right there. I've come like 13,000 kilometers, so hopefully, you know, it's, it's been good so far. Um, I, I mainly work on the Twisted project um, in my open source stuff. So I'm a core developer and a release manager, and I've single-handedly ported the most code to Python 3. Um, <laughs> so so uh, I've personally had a hand in porting about 40,000 lines of code, which is about 20 to 25 percent of Twister's uh, code base, um, as well as some auxiliary things and some things that use Twisted. So this is pretty much, you know, how how it is when I'm working on it. So, and I'm here today because of uh, my my work, uh, which is Cross.io. We um, do WebSocket routers and WebSocket RPC and um, stuff for your browsers and all of that. So I, I also do um, same sort of release management there as well, binary release management and uh, more porting to Python 3, as, as well as um, web API uh, and REST integration into Crossbar. So the original idea for this talk comes from two people, Russell Keith McGee and Glyph Libikowitz. So Russ asked me the question, why is Twisted relevant when there's async IO? Now, he knows the reason why it's relevant, but he likes to play devil's advocate, so. But I think it is, you know, kind of worth answering for those that aren't as ingrained into it as, as I may be, or as he may be from me ranting about it, like, endlessly whenever I see him. Glyph uh, published a blog post about it, and it goes into a lot of the same things that I'm going to go into, but, you know, it's... Um, it's good, I, I recommend checking it out. And he talks about it from a more of a long uh, sort of perspective, as he's been part of the project for a very long time. And I've been on it for three or four years, so it's a bit of different perspectives as far as the time scale goes. Now, one of the core problems you have when you're writing any software, pretty much ever, is that you want to do some form of I.O. Now, I mainly do web stuff. So you have web frameworks, and they're all pretty good, except the problem with it, from this hilarious joke, is that the more conventional ones, like Django, Pyramid, Flask, all of that, they only really serve one request at any one time. Now, the way you get around that is you deploy using runners, and these runners, have multiple copies, uh, and they put these multiple copies in threads and processes. So you are effectively still processing one request at a time, but you're requesting, uh, you're handling the request in parallel. So it sort of gets around it in, you know, okay sort of way. Now in Python specifically, Threads or processes won't really help you with what's called C10K, which is 10,000 concurrent connections. Now, when you try, you know, it sort of ends up looking a bit like this. Uh, <laughs> mainly because in Python and in programming languages in, uh, in general, threads are very hard to use safely. You end up with race conditions, and it's really hard to reason about your code from a purely like reading the code perspective, because threads, threads decide when they want to change between each other, not you. You don't get control over that. You can try and get control over over it using um, explicit yield points, but this doesn't always like, for example, GeoVent. But this doesn't always work. They're also a bit hard to scale with in Python specifically, because if you have one thread per connection, you're going to have thread memory overhead. Now. That's like the Python stack. So by default, it's like eight megabytes on, on Python of virtual memory. Now, even if it doesn't use all of that, that can stack up pretty quickly. If you're just using 128 kilobytes per your thread for the stack and some various other things, 
if you have 10,000 of those threads, you're going to have like 1.3 gigabytes of overhead without doing any processing at all. And none of your business logic, none of your like fancy application stuff, just threading. And until the gelectomy happens or until software transactional memory in PyPy becomes a thing that you can use without downsides, you don't end up with parallelism either. Because the global interpreter lock means that only one of these threads may be running Python at any one time. You can get around it with C extensions so that you can do heavy, li heavy lifting in those. But if you're writing Python, you're probably going to have, at least in the early stages, everything in Python. You, you can't afford to put everything in C, C extensions. Cython makes this a bit easier. But you know, it's, it's still something that you have to special case the easiest way of maintaining it and the fastest uh, production code, which is not good because you want them to be kind of one and the same. You also won't do threads properly. Pretty much no one in this room can do threads properly. <laughs> Even if you've written thread using code, there's probably some subtle thing where it's going wrong and you won't know until it's really, really bad. <laughs> Um, if, if a fun thing is when people say that you can do threading properly, especially like when they're like C threading, yeah, that works. You know, there's applications that use it. If you look at the CVE database and search for race condition, and look at when there's thread race conditions, there's been untold amounts of damage from not handling a thread properly from a small race condition happening. Micro threads like G events and eventlet, they're not really better. They still have some of the similar problems, and Glyph talks about them much better than I ever could, so I recommend checking that out. All these slides will be up online, so you don't have to worry about getting this even shortened URL. Now, something that Twisted uses, as well as Tornado, Async IO, all of those frameworks, is non-threaded asynchronous IO. So we all use it, it's the common approach, um, compared to, for example, Eventlint and G-Event, which use green threads. So Twisted was one of the first. Um, it's been around uh, for known history, at least since 2001. There was bits of CVS before it, but all of that is lost to time. So let's just pretend it's done in 2001. Um, I recently moved to Git, yay, we're catching up on the 21st century. It's amazing. <laughs> AsyncIO is a bit newer, so it's, it's been around since 2012. It was one of its first commits. In the very core of them, they both use the identical system calls. Um, they're called selector functions. Now, they're like select, poll, epoll, and what happens is you give them a list of file descriptors. For example, sockets, open files, uh, network, uh, sorry, Unix pipes, all sorts of things, that rarely anything that has a file descriptor. And it will tell you what is ready to have operations done on it. The most common ones of these are reading and writing, because you will have, for example, you won't be able to read anything if the client hasn't sent you anything. You won't be able to write anything if the, uh, if the send buffer is completely full. So these selector functions tell you when you can do these things without blocking. So you can tell it to do it, and it'll cache it there, and it won't take an indeterminate amount of time. Now, selector loops can quite easily handle thousands and thousands and thousands, thousands of open sockets and events per second. So for example here, this is just on my Mac. It can support C10K on my Mac with just making U limit so it can accept 10,000 connections. And it works fine with not really that much CPU load. So it is something that you can do on commodity hardware. You can do it on you know, a standard laptop. You might want to have a bit more of a beefy machine if you're serving actually 10,000 concurrent real people all doing real work. But it's not, the, it's not a problem to handle that many connections. You can ha with these selector loops and these selector frameworks like AsyncIO and Twisted, you can just do it. You, you don't need to worry about having things in C or that to handle that many connections. Generally what happens is that data is channeled through a transport. So for example, a TCP connection, a UDP datagram, a Unix socket, a, a file or anything to a protocol implementation. So a protocol implementation is a thing that actually takes the bytes and transforms that into something useful. For example, HTTP. It goes from a series of random bytes on the wire with whatever data and content might be there. And then the HTTP protocol will actually parse that into something you can interact with. 
Now, in these frameworks, sending data is queued until the network is ready, because if you're trying to send a one megabyte file and you've only got a 512k kbit uplink, it's going to be quite a few cycles until it can send all of, that, all of that data down on the network. And nothing blocks, because it waits until things can be done. And then it just says, you know, while I'm waiting for this, you can serve all these other connections. I don't care. So the thing that uses the selector loops, oh, the thing that uses the selector functions are called IO loops or in twisted parlance reactors, named after the reactor pattern because data coming in is events and you react to it. The great thing about it is that you end up with much higher density per core. Now, that C10K demo thing that I screenshot it there, that was only using one core. That wasn't using multiple threads or multiple cores. That was just a single CPU. You also don't need to have threads around. So it works on things that don't support threads. And it also works on, uh, it also means that you don't have to have the thread overhead. You still end up with uh, no parallelism because you're still only one CPU and one thread, but you end up with concurrency. You can handle multiple requests at once because when you can't continue serving one request, you yield and let the loop handle the next one. The best case for it are the sort of applications that a lot of us are writing today. So they do a lot of I.O. For example, uh, sending stuff down the network. You're, uh, for example, on Twitter, you, you don't really do a lot of CPU intensive stuff. You maybe send some pictures and send some text and mainly wait for the database to come back with that or for the client to send you some information or all, that, all of that sort of thing. So because you're not using a lot of CPU per connection, you can hold 10,000, 20,000, as many as you want, really, as much as you have RAM for, as much as you, your IO loop uh, can handle in one second. It also works really well when you have high latency clients, because clients might take an indeterminate amount of time to respond. Now, if you have, one, if you have 10 threads, and each one is serving a client that is uploading a picture, and the client suddenly decides to not send you any data for 500 milliseconds, that thread is being occupied for 500 milliseconds doing nothing, but it's still blocked and still waiting for data to come. And nowadays, you're probably waiting on either the client to send you information or the database to give you information. Generally, most web applications nowadays are thin layers on top of databases and on top of sort of task management systems like Celery that actually go and do the hard processing on specialized like data farms or on other boxes, not your web servers. Some of the implementations come with some nice abstractions so that you don't have to handle all of this like directly. The most common one is that they provide an object, and that object is a stand-in for some results in the future, um, and a way of telling you when that result has happened. Now, future in async IO is one of these. Twisted uses deferreds. They are very much the same. They have di slightly different ways of operating, but they both have the core concept, a thing that you can pass around when you don't actually have a result yet. For example, a deferred, if you want to, um, you have a deferred, which is an empty thing. It does not have a result yet. You tell it that you want to print when, you, when it, call, it calls back with a result, and then you call it back with a result. So now the deferred has a value, and it works through the callback chain. Features work very much the same. You have a feature, which is empty, and then you add a callback to it, and then you set a result on it. Now, there are two different uh, ways of saying it. You have, you have callback here, and you have set result there, but they're pretty much identical. Uh, identical. Apart from one little thing, deferreds run callbacks as soon as they're able to. So they'll run it synchronously and won't yield to the I.O. loop. But futures will schedule a callback to happen on the next I.O. loop, which is a bit fairer scheduling. That's pretty much the core difference. So if we've got twisted, why do we need a new solution? Why do we need async IO? Only 2012 was kind of a bit of a mess, um, as far as Python dev was concerned. G events and event weren't ported yet, so that only happened this year, I believe, so it's been quite a while coming. Not much of Twisted was ported, so you couldn't really build any real applications on Twisted on Python 3. 
Most of Tornado had been ported, though, so you could write it if you were using that, but Tornado is uh, slightly less used than like Geovant and Twist and all of that. So one of the, one of the major ones was ported, but it doesn't cover everyone. Elsewhere, Node.js was completely exploding in popularity. Everyone was using it. Like PayPal was like, yeah, let's port everything to it. And everything was sort of happening very fast over there. And async await uh, landed in .NET 4.5. So it was sort of a nicer way of doing this sort of asynchronous stuff. Now, Node.js is quite similar to async.io and Twisted. It has the same event loop at its core. It uses libuv, which is a layer on top of all of those selector functions. But it all works very much the same, and it did sort of give credence to the idea of this being a workable solution for pretty much everyone, that it was no longer something that was kind of niche, that you couldn't just put things in threads anymore, that there was a real use case for this. Python 3 adoption was kind of getting there. You know, it's, it's, always going to, it's always taken a while for Python 3 to get massive adoption. But there wasn't really anything that was sort of Python 3's cool thing. There wasn't anything that you could really look at because there wasn't typing yet. There wasn't any async IO. It was nice cleanups, but that was about it. So why async IO specifically? It was designed around coroutines. Now, coroutines in Python are a special kind of generator. Um, so a generator is a function that it sort of suspends. So it might not have a value yet, so it suspends until it does. So kind of similar to a future and a deferred. Uh, Python 3.5 especially contains syntax that makes futures act like coroutines, and coroutines act like futures, and various other things that sort of makes them sort of work together. So for example here, if we have this code example here, it's just a loop that prints um, time for five seconds, or every second for five seconds. Now you'll see the special thing there. Do I have the thingy? Yeah. So the special thing here is the async def. Now that is what defines a coroutine. You also have this special keyword here called await. Now await is very much like yield is in Python 2 and Python 3 except it's, it, it doesn't actually talk to the generator itself. It delegates to a subgenerator. Now, it's, it's a little bit strange how this works, but it does mean that the implementation is a lot cleaner, and it does mean that it, it works a lot nicer, especially when you have async def and there's like async for. All these sorts of things were introduced in 3.5, and it made working with coroutines and working with asynchronous stuff so much easier because all you need to do to await is just type await, and then if you can await on this, it will. So asyncio.sleep1 returns a future. Now, in this coroutine, you can await on a future, and then it will wait for the results. So if, for example, I'll, I'll explain this a bit better. So what happens is this, uh, this line here suspends until the future returned by asyncio.sleep actually has a result. So it doesn't just keep looping, it waits for one second. Now, because it uses the event loop here, it doesn't actually mean that this waits one second. All it does is tells the reactor, in one second, stop suspending this feature. Like, tell this feature that it has a result in one second, so that it will continue with the loop. So you don't have to worry about callbacks, you don't have to worry about all that sort of structuring of your code, because it just acts kind of like your old Python code used to. It's very sort of Pythonic. Another thing that AsyncIO was really meant to do was repair the library API fragmentation. Because you've got Twisted, you've got Tornado, you've got even Geovent, for example, all have a different way of doing things. And there shouldn't really be so many different ways of doing the same task. And if you look at the, the Zen of Python, there should be one and, and probably and, and should only be one way of doing things. So this sort of hopefully was like, here's the one that is how you do it, and all these frameworks can, Im can implement it, and you don't have to do it three or four different ways, you just do it like one. Of course, we all know that XKCD comic about how there's 30 standards, we should define it under one, and now there's 31 competing standards. But, you know, this, this time it's kind of different. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> it also 
was meant to reduce duplication because async IO would implement the same thing that all, these all of these selector frameworks had internally, which was the selector loop. Now, if async IO brought its own, then that means that all these other frameworks don't have to have what is essentially the same code. There can be one, one central one that is centrally maintained, all the bug fixes happen there, all of the knowledge can be poured into the one implementation, and you don't end up with several ones that have several small bugs or work slightly differently or have downsides. You just have one, and then it can hopefully be the best thing. So does AsyncIO replace Twisted? Well, no. They both do the same sort of thing. They have cooperative, single-threaded multitasking. They have primitives for supporting asynchronous programming, like features like thirds and coroutines like inline callbacks and twisted, sort of. They use the same system APIs, you know, select, poly, poly, KQ, ICP on Windows. And it, async IO kind of took the protocols and transports abstraction from twisted, which separates the thing that is the wire and the thing that processes the actual bytes of the wire as two separate concepts, um, which is really handy if you've got things like um, TCP, except it's actually TCP over some other protocol, which happens. For example, I think it's like TCP over SOX or whatever, uh, the old proxy sort of thing. It, it works a lot better if you separate them out so that the individual protocols don't have to care about what their transport is. So it has the same sort of benefits of Twisted in that regard. It's also very architecturally similar internally. If you read the Twisted reactor source code and you read the async IO event loop source code, you can see the same things being done, slightly different ways, but they're essentially doing the same thing. And it's a newer and standard API, and it's just there in Python 3.4. You don't have to pip install anything. You don't have to worry about any of that. And you just import async IO and off you go. Now, where this falls down is that Twisted is an async IO thing. And async IO itself is an async IO thing. And they're the same kind of thing. And surely you only need one of these things. So Twisted, just, you just replace your Twisted usage with async IO. Well, that's some work, because async IO is like an apple. And Twisted is a fruit salad. Twisted is, for example, much bigger. And uh, for example, here, if you look at the amount of lines of code we have, it's a lot more. <laughs> um, we also have a lot more comments, which I like. Uh, <laughs> so if you, if you remove the tests and then you just do the pure implementation, it's like 10 times bigger. Now, that's not because Twisted is 10 times as bloated, or it does the same thing in 10 times the amount of code. It does a lot more than that. It's not only the core reactor, it is also protocols, for example, HTTP, IMAP, uh, POP3, uh, DNS, SSH, all of these different things. And it kind of all does this in one package, because when Twisted was first made, nothing else really kind of did it in the same way. And there was, were a lot of things that, Python, uh, that Twisted does that Python didn't have yet. For example, auto dictionaries. We, have, we had our own, and I think we just recently removed it when we dropped 2.6 two support. We had to have our own auto dictionary lying around um, because it wasn't in Python until 2.7. Or 2.6, I forget. And one big package was very much easier to distribute in the early days of Python. You didn't have pip, you didn't have PyPI that worked as well as it did. And even if you did have PyPI, it was down every 20 minutes. And it, was, it wasn't a good time. So if you just had one package, it was a lot easier to use and a lot easier to install because it was just th one thing. And it also came with basically everything you needed, batteries included, more or less. If we pull this down to what Twisted does, uh, what async IO does, and the equivalent Twisted code, they're very much the same. The cores are essentially equivalent. And this equivalent core is basically those primitives, the core async IO utils, a couple of Python utilities that Twisted has that's in Python 3 now, and a couple of protocols that use all of the above. So some quite basic protocols. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I did the wrong slide. This slide is showing that early Python code, for example, Django 1.9, is very much the same sort of size as Twisted. So Twisted is big, but Django is also big. 
This is the size of a compass. <laughs> Lots of graphs in this one. So as you can see, they're roughly about the same size uh, in lines of code. Uh, which we see a little bit bigger, but you know. But if you actually look at what Twister does internally and what you need async IO to do to do the equivalent sort of thing, it is very much sort of the same. You're going to end up with a lot of code. So some people say, you know, async IO isn't bloated. Twist is bloated. Look how big it is. Look, look, at, all of the, look at all of the code. It's very big and bloated. Well, no, we just do stuff. <laughs> We also have some protocol implementations that aren't quite in async IO, like HP2. I um, don't think that's in AO HP2 yet. There might be one or two, but Twisted has it uh, like nearly first class support, for, for example. But enough about Twisted. Let's talk about Tornado. Who here has used Tornado? Yeah. So Tornado is another asynchronous framework uh, for Python. It's a specifically asynchronous web framework. It's made by FriendFeed, um, which was later bought by Facebook and then was torn apart and you know, dissolved because that's what happens if you get bought by Facebook. Um, it's sort of similar in some ways. The transport is very similar to the IO stream, but their protocols are a little bit mixed in. They don't have to worry about the general, gener, generality. There we go, first flub of the word. Generality that Twisted and Async IO have. It does implement its own selector loop. Um, and it does actually have Twisted and Async IO integration. So you can yield defers or you can yield features. And they might actually remove their event loop and just replace it with Async IO. So as you can see, they've, they've you know, got a bit further into using the standard sort of thing. And they're a really great example of interoperation. And is this kind of the future of Twisted? Now, <laughs> interoperation is hard. Um, as anyone that's ever had to work with a system that's similar but not quite the same, you know, it's, it kind of has its difficulties. My focus has been the async await keyword. Um, this was introduced as PEP, like, oh, here we go, PEP 0492, and I believe it was mostly written by Yuri Semenov. I can't pronounce the last name. <laughs> it was introduced in Python 3.5, so it's in a Python you can use right now, and it's Pretty cool, I gave the code example earlier. It makes things a lot easier to read and looks a lot like your regular Python code. You don't have to worry about callbacks, you don't have to worry about callback hell, you don't have to worry about um, lambdas for all sorts of things just to add a value together and then pass it down the callback chain because you just await and then you just do it on the next line. So wait, as I, exam uh, as I explained, gets the result of a coroutine sort of works, you have a coroutine, and you await on a coroutine, which is sort of like a feature now in async IO. They sort of act like each other. And they are a special kind of generator. Similar to yield from, it delegates to a sub-generator, and it lets you have asynchronous code executed in a synchronous style, which is the, the main draw to it. Twisted's had a sort of a, a same sort of thing since around 2006 called inline callbacks, where you use the old yield function, which is very much similar to how Gevent does it, that you use yield and then you write sort of your standard Python code and you don't worry about callbacks as much. But I am working on the interop, and coming soon is a little thing called ensure deferred. And what that does is it takes a coroutine and it turns it into a deferred. And then that coroutine itself can await on deferreds. So if you want to write twisted code on Python 3.5, you can just await things. You don't have to worry about deferreds or callbacks or anything like that. If it returns a deferred, you just await on it. And then, if, and then because it's async def, it is actually a, um, let's see, I've forgotten the word now. What is it? Coroutine, yes, I said it 12 seconds ago and I forgot. Um, it's a coroutine, so you just go down here and show deferred of the function that takes the coroutine and that returns a deferred. So that means that you can write this code and if it's like, use it, I, I accept a deferred, you can be like, well, I'm just gonna write this async def function and the other code doesn't know because it returns a deferred and you can yield deferreds inside of it. Also coming is a async IO reactor, which is, a, async, uh, a twisted reactor on top of async IO. 
So sort of replacing those twisted internals with async I.O. in the sort of original idea of what was supposed to happen. So it's on top of async I.O., so that means that you can share the different things. So you can have a twisted protocol, or in this example, for example, this is AIO HTTP, so using UV loop, which is the like high-performance um, async I.O. reactor. So this trek here is a twisted thing, and AIO HTTP is an async I.O. thing. We just get the reactor, and we just tell it, yeah, we're running. And this here is just a coroutine, which is AIO HTTP coroutine, so for example, handling a web request. And we're doing some uh, twisted, uh, some trek um, sort of stuff in there. We just go defer to future, and then the async I.O. code just believes that's async I.O. code. It'll wait and wait for the deferred to fire. And because they're running on the same reactor underneath, they will sort of let, they won't block the other. So you'll be able to have some async I.O. stuff, some twisted stuff, and it won't really matter. So yeah, here's, here's the core part of it. Just defer dot defer to future. So hopefully the next version of Twisted will come with it. Um, Async IO does need to patch one or two little things. Um, I've been discussing with them that PyCon US has got to follow up on it a bit more. But you know, it is there. It is very close to having that sort of thing where you can have Tornado, Twisted, and Async IO all using the same event loop. And you can sort of bring your own and bring the different abstractions from the different frameworks and use whatever you're most comfortable with. But why is Twist itself, apart from async I.O., still worth using? It's released often. We have three plus uh, times a year that we have releases. 2016 is set to have five releases, which is uh, qu quite often in uh, sort of a size of Twisted sort of project. That means that we're going to be able to get features out a lot quicker than, for example, async I.O., because async I.O. has to wait either for a new pip release, um, which I'm not sure when they do it, or wait for a new Python release. Their time-based releases taken off our trunk branch, so we just say, yep, yeah, we'll release here. So you don't end up with big features that are sort of half-merged, because the trunk still has to keep working. So you can get the cutting edge pretty safely. We do have a lot of protocols out of the box, so here's just a small list of them, like just some of the random ones that I've seen people use. Not finger that much, but you know, that was, it's in our tutorial. So a lot of them are, some of them are ported to Python 3, some of them aren't. It just comes down to someone saying, oh, we use that protocol, we want to be on Python 3, and then I sit up at 3 a.m. porting it, and then <laughs> that's ported, basically. And it's super easy to actually make your own protocols. So if you need to talk to some custom system, or you feel like writing your own protocol for whatever reason, you can just do it in Twisted. S same with async I.O. Um, it's very quite easy. So that there is just an example of something that just echoes out uh, whatever you send to it on the command line. We also have HTTP2, which is really cool because this is pure Python HTTP2. So this is without Nginx, without Apache, all of that, pure Python. So you can just pip install twisted square brackets HTTP2 and then just set up your TLS certificate because that's how um, it negotiates that. So your browser says, I want HTTP2 in the TLS request. And then it'll just let you have HTTP2. And pretty soon, we're going to have all the server push stuff and the client support. And it's kind of cool that you can just do this in Python. And this also means that when we get deferred to future and future deferred working, that you can write async IO code that uses HTTP2. We also do have established library support. We've been around for a very long time, and we do have a lot of handy little things. One of my favorite libraries is TXACME and TXSNI, which is a Python interface to Let's Encrypt, and it lets you do automatic certificate renewal. So if, for example, you go to my website, which is at least for now .net, you'll get uh, a HT, it'll go onto HTTPS. Now, I don't actually have to provision the certificates or anything like that. I just turn on TXACME, and it goes and automatically gets it, gets the certificate, and does the challenge, and handles all of that, and then sets it up. So I have like a straight A on the Quella's SSL test without ever actually having to look at a certificate. There's Hendrix, which is like a whiskey runner, um, which uses Twisted, lets you do WebSockets and TLS and run Twisted code inside your blocking 
um, like Django or Flask or whatever code, so it's a, it's a pretty cool project. Spotterbarn, which is one of the things I work on, which, for example, because Twisted and Async IO share the same sort of protocol and transport abstractions, it's a WebSocket library that, that has a single protocol and then sort of shims for Async IO and Twisted. So you have the same sort of dependable base of WebSockets, and it will work the same on Async IO and Twisted, um, and it works pretty well under PyPy, the optimizing uh, JIT compiler, which is also very good. And also the HTTP2 stuff here also works very well under PyPy and is actually probably one of the faster HTTP2 implementations out there. We're also a very dependable base because we try not to break a code. Now, as some people that have been on the receiving end of my releases may know, we don't always do this. But Twist is a very big project, and we try not to. And that's kind of, you know, at least half like not breaking your code. We have deprecation cycles. So we don't have dot one, uh, two dot zero. We don't have three dot zero. We say that we want to get rid of the usage of this. So we're going to have a new version that does things right. And we're going to deprecate the old one. And in a year, we're, or a year or more, sometimes depends, we'll actually just remove it. So when you upgrade from, for example, 16.3, something might be deprecated. You see the deprecation warning, you fix it, and then come by like 17.3, it's gone. So it means that we're constantly getting the new stuff and updated stuff, and it's a lot more fluid than if you have, for example, the big 2.0 release that breaks everything, and then you end up never porting. You just need to make sure you're on the latest version of Twisted, which is pretty easy because the releases are every couple of months, so they're not huge changes, they're rather small. Um, so you can upgrade with basically impunity. You can just see that there's deprecation warnings and you run your tests against it because you have tests, don't you? Yes, yes you run your tests and then you can go, okay, everything is fine, and then when something does break, you're just fixing one little thing, not the entire bunch. We also have code review. Um, code review is sort of the thing that Twister did, and now everyone else is doing it, <laughs> so because it's great. Uh, we have lots of automated tests, like thousands and thousands and thousands of tests. So we try and make sure that everything in our code base will work because we have a test to prove it. We're about 90%, so your code will only break like if you're using the 10%, <laughs> which is actually probably stuff like, what was it? If you use the MSN support, which I removed because it sucked, you don't actually use MSN anymore. It's kind of terrible. Um, you can also add PyPy to it because most of our tests pass. We're working on getting the last 10 or 15 tests. They're all C Python assumptions, like they're just in uh, the garbage collector, sorry. It assumes like when it goes out of scope, it'll be immediately garbage collected. Not, not the case on PyPy, and we need to alter our tests for that. But we have a lot of people that run it in production. We run it in production ourselves. And the speed performance, uh, the speed benefit is absolutely amazing. You can handle like twice as many TCP connections just by switching out your Python compiler. You can serve a bajillion more DNS requests and you can do so much more templating per second because it's a just-in-time compiler. So those core inner, uh, inner loops are all transpiled to machine code and then they go really fast. We support a bunch of platforms. So that means that the test pass on the platform and we gate any mergers that it needs to pass. So we end up with a huge bunch, so pretty much nearly anything you run, it'll work. There's even a couple of other platforms that unofficially support it that work pretty well. Um, we have people running it on like, uh, like the HP UX, like the, that Unix thing. And it works, and I don't know how, but, you know. <laughs> we support Python 2.7 on all platforms, Python 3.4 and 3.5 on Linux. Um, Python 3.3 as well, but I don't think there's any current platforms that aren't end of life, so we don't test on it anymore. PyPy's close, a few tests remain. And PyPy 3, which is actually 3.3.5, is getting worked on. So that means that you'll be able to have your Python 3 code and also a fast code, rather than picking clean Python 3 code or fast Python 2 code. And support's coming to Windows soon for Python 3, uh, 3.4 and 3.5, just cleaning up the last little things. And most of all, the reason why I think 
Twisted, and Tornado, and all of those other frameworks that aren't asynchro have real value, is that competition is really good. We fit in this ecosystem, if only as competitors, because we can have some things that are good, and then asynchro can go and do things better, and that means that we have to go do things better to compete. So it means that we just keep moving forward all together as a community. And as the interoperation gets better, it means that we all benefit. Now, where to from here for Twisted, for async IO? Well, interoperation is the big thing, because then that means that you can use all of your old Twisted code and your new async IO code and your new Twisted code and all of that on Python 3. There's the async sig mailing list, uh, which I haven't actually subscribed to yet. But we are going to be talking a lot more in the coming weeks, coming months, coming years especially, um, about interoperation between all the frameworks and making it so that everything sort of works together. Now, if you want to know some more about, for example, protocols, I recommend Corey Benfield. Uh, he's one of the request maintainer and the uh, author of the Twisted HTTP2 support. Uh, PyCon US talk told building protocol libraries the right way alternately titled, You Do It Wrong, and all of my libraries except one do it right. No, wait, I'll boy around. <laughs> and Thinking in Coroutines by Lucas Langa at PyCon US. So also a good thing about thinking, uh, talking about how coroutines themselves work and how they especially work in this context of async IO and how they work internally, which is um, kind of good to know if you're running, if you ever run into it, some issues about it. And questions. So ask questions. If you would like to yell at me about how I'm wrong, please wait until afterwards. You can yell at me how I'm wrong. Ouch. I love it. Yes? How much value would you see in porting like, uh, Scrapey into async Scrape I, uh, Scrapey, I would say that there's probably not any value in it, um, especially once the interoperation stuff comes into account. Um, because, so Scrapey is, I believe you write, it's like a whole bunch of tools and then you do write asynchronous stuff for fetching the pages and processing them, right? So in that case, like because Scrapey is large, I don't think that something like Scrapey could really survive a transition to async IO without some major rift. You can't completely break all the existing code and all of that without some ramifications. Now, with like interoperation stuff, then that means that you sort of, it do, doesn't matter what Scrapey itself is written in because it'll work with your async IO database adapters and your async IO other things. Um, but as far as like Scrapey and other projects, it's kind of worth just keeping on whatever you're on and waiting for everything to catch up talking with each other because it's, you just can't re rewrite that amount of code without something going wrong. And you know that's the unfortunate bit is that you can't just pick one and go, oh, this is better because all the existing code won't work, and that's really valuable to some people. Yes. This one. Okay, so this await here and this await here? Yeah. Okay, so the reason is that this get here, this is actually a, a thing about Trex um, interface, is that dot get will return when you have headers, um, and then the dot content on the dot get, on the thing that's returned there, will return when the entire body is fetched. So that's, that's just a particular thing for this API, that you get an early response that's not the entire body, and then you ask it, get the rest of the body, which might take hours, minutes, days, depending on how big it is and how what your connection is. So that's just a purely sort of thing there. You can use as many await statements as you want um, and all of that, so um, it's really just limited by your imagination. But uh, yeah, this is sort of an interesting example showing the early interop. Like, as you can see, there's some really ugly, terrible stuff here for how AO, HTTP, HTTP thinks headers are and how Twisted thinks headers are, because we think ours are uh, like lists of, yeah, it's, it's different. <laughs> but yes. Uh, orange, yep. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, so that's actually up in re uh, almost up in review right now. Is that so? That's what this uh, Twister Internal Async Hyo Reactor, which is in almost review, is pretty much doing. Is that what it is? Is that so? You have the Async Hyo event loop, and then all this here is just maps the function calls to the Async Hyo function calls. So the low level operating system uh, calls are Async Yes. So Async Hyo manages all that. And that's just because um, the interface to the reactor is very similar, but we use camel case and async IO uses um, not camel case, snake case, and we use different names for things. So it's just purely as a, as a thing going up presently so that things keep working on top. But this is not out yet. This is pretty much up for review. And there exists something uh, currently on PyPI called TX Tulip, which is just actually this. Um, and I've just improved it a little bit to make it work on, I think, ePoll a bit better. Um, but it, it's been done for, so yeah. Yes? Two questions. Um, TXIO, is it working? Uh, TXIO, uh, so yes. Um, that's one of the things the crossbar and Tavendo, um, yeah, crossbar and formerly Tavendo. Uh, we actually work on that's what we use for crossbar and uh, sorry we use it for autobahn. So the thing about TXIO is that because the autobahn needs to work on Python 2.7, we can't really use the coroutine way of interop, which will be uh, sadly Python 3.5 plus um, because coroutines sort of give that little gap where we can do the compatibility. So if you need to support Python 2, TXIO is sort of good at that. But the better way, uh, well, it, it is sort of two things. You don't want to use it too heavily because you want to do in the way of, where is it? Uh, Corey Benfield's thing. So where he's essentially got his protocol, which is the meat and potatoes of like the HTTP2 support. And all of that is synchronous. It doesn't use features or deferreds. Um, it's like a state machine. And then you have a wrapper around that that handles making the futures, making the thirds. Now, TXAO is that for Autobahn, and it's useful for some other projects. Um, but I would say that going forward for writing new code, the coroutines way of interop will be better because it's you know it's a lot more Pythonic. Um, while TXAO, you're sort of reduced to a common delimiter, uh, yeah, co lowest common delimiter of what futures and thirds both do to make it work. So you don't end up using like deferreds how you would use deferreds or futures how you would use futures because you sort of have to use them both at the same time. Um, so it's, it's good for current software, but there will be more optimal solutions in the coming years and when we drop Python 2 support as like a community, then it'll get a bit better. So the only competitor that Twisted on PyPy has in the async IO world is UB loop. So um, where is UB loop? Sorry, I'm jumping between these so much. So UB loop, no, that's not UB loop. This is UB loop. So UB loop here, uh, here, yeah. That is the only thing that can come anywhere close to Twisted on PyPy. Now the problem with UB loop is that UB loop is the core event loop is in C. But if you look at URI's benchmarks, it doesn't actually make uh, something like AIO HTTP any faster, because that there you're restricted by Python's interpretation. So while PyPy in that case, even if our reactor is slower, all of the actual protocol code is much, much faster. So I'd say that when PyPy 3 comes out, and UV loop gets a port to CFFI, so it works better on PyPy and other sorts of things, then you're going to have a truly fast um, async IO. But that's just like, it's plenty fast already, and UV loop makes it really good for most things. But you know, it's twisted and PyPy is still 
top of the pack as far as I'm concerned, just because the JIT works on all your protocol code as well, which is, you know, when in real world applications, that's the bulk of the processing that's happening, not the reactor. Um, sure. Yeah, so yeah, so the problem with multiprocessing is that multi uh, multiprocessing is great. Well, multi as in running it in multiple processes is great in the context where you have CPU bound workloads. So if you're doing lots of math, doing lots of things like that. So in that case, you're still going to need multiprocessing. You're still going to need, I think Async IO has a thing in concurrent called like process executor or something like that, which is sort of you run some code in a process and it returns a feature. Now that sort of thing is still going to be valuable going forward simply because until we have true threading in Python, which although Larry Hastings' gelectomy is coming up and I think going well, we've still got all these Python versions that won't have that. And we, it might not even land in Python because it might break the C API too much. So both, yes, it's good to say don't do blocking calls because blocking networking calls are the devil and should not be done. But we also need to twist it and async and all of that, get it easier to run code in processes really easily for the sort of thing where it's not networking, where it is CPU workloads, where it's processing images or doing natural language processing and all that sort of thing. So sort of half and half is that you probably shouldn't use multiprocessing for talking to the network, but it does still have a lot of value. And, and we, we need to get better at supporting it going forward, like as a, as a sort of having one central way of doing it, which async Co has one, but that's not two, I think. Yes. Uh, you first, and then you. So. Uh, sorry? I, I would say not. Um, the eventual future is probably going to be that we ditch all of our reactors and Twisted becomes the protocols, and that's it, rather than the other way around. Um, and it's more likely that we're going to sp uh, split out more and more of our Python utilities, for example, Deferred, which is purely just a Python utility, um, and split all that into different sort of Python packages so it can be more widely used. So. That is the sort of future I optimistically see Twisted going, is that it is essentially just a bunch of protocols for async IO, but that's not going to happen until at least 20, like 30, uh, sorry, 2023, because we are giving, so with the 2020 Python 2 drop, Twisted's not subscribing to that because we could only start porting at Python 3.3. It was the first version we could realistically port code. And we want to give our users the five years um, death notice. So, you know, once, once it goes, we drop 2.7 support, which is most likely in 2023, maybe longer, it depends, maybe shorter. Maybe everything is ported tomorrow, and then we can just drop it tomorrow. Um, I would say that that would be, yeah, the eventual best case is that we don't have the reactor. We don't have all these utilities. We are just protocols. Thank you. Sorry, did the person? Yep. Yep. A uh, little loud. So talking to databases, so for example, um, one great thing is, okay, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of the current ones talk to a socket, so they wouldn't work as, as stands. There is a library for Twisted called CX Postgres, which wraps the native async parts of the Postgres C library. So it just uses that and does all of that, but it, you will ultimately need to write brand new database drivers that are natively asynchronous. So it's, yeah, you're gonna have to write a lot of code for that. Um, the usual way to do it is just wrap it in the thread pool and go shrug, but that's not 
the optimum way. Uh, native ones will always work better, will be more efficient, and, uh, but yeah, so it will require a lot of code rewriting, which is fun. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yes. Um, so I believe a lot of applications actually can be written in paradigms that don't require like GIL and stuff. So can you think of examples where like uh, concurrency or actually in particular GIL is a true constraint? The GIL is only a true constraint when you are dealing with C extensions. Mm. With C extensions. So the thing that PyPy has is it's got this experimental thing called the STM, which is software transactional memory. Now, when that kind of gets forward a bit more and doesn't crash as much, uh, because STM is a bit, uh, it's, it's a wonderful technology. Basically, what it means is that rather than having a global interpreter lock, you have a lot of finer locks. And you lock specific bits of memory. Now, when you do something like Twisted or Async Ion or all of that, where you have the core reactor, and then all the things that come down from it. But these individual sort of handlers don't talk to each other. So that means that in the sort of the jewel free world, you just say all of these have a software transactional memory lock for their own sections, and then they all run in parallel. So the jill, if you, if you, in a world where there isn't C extensions, <laughs> or there's uh, better C extensions, and you're writing twisted and async IO and all of that, then Jill is not required, essentially, because it's just a thing that the C API needs and also prevents race conditions. That's also the other thing. While software transactional memory also prevents race conditions by having finer locking. So if one tries to talk to memory, then another one is locked, it will actually run in sequence, not parallel. So it'll work around it. So Jill is not required, basically. But it's there because everything is horrible. <laughs> Anyone else? No, no more questions? Come on. You, you look like you want to ask a question. All of, all of you I just pointed at, so I'm being general. <laughs> I, am I? Oh, OK. OK, how about this? Who wants coffee? OK. <laughs> I love being the last slot because I can just run over time. It's great. Uh, sorry?